And uh, I think that's all we need to get through before we introduce our guests tonight. We have Tim and Sarah Kirk, uh, Kilpatrick from Hero Factor Games going to talk to us about their new game, uh, Pangolin's Puzzle. Is it, it's the Pangolin's Puzzle, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I'm really curious to hear how this happened because uh, I know they announced uh, your game Nobody's Favorites, right? Mm -hmm. Last year, and one of the characters in that is a pangolin. If you've never seen a pangolin, you're probably about to. Uh, it's kind of a furry, almost um, what's it, armadillo kind of like thing. But they have a pangolin with bangles <laughs> on its arms. And it's, I, I don't know if the reaction to that was the sole reason that you decided to give it its own game. Uh, but I, I hope, see, like secretly, I hope that's why this happened. So uh, they're going to tell us about their game, uh, maybe teach us a little bit about project management, which is something we haven't really talked about in here. Uh, so I'm going to stop talking. Uh, here is Tim and Sarah Kilpatrick. Thanks, Richard. Hi. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for allowing us to come out here and talk to you tonight. Uh, really appreciate it. So yes, I'm Tim Kilpatrick. I'm here with my wife and co-founder Sarah Kilpatrick. Uh, we founded Hero Factor Games um, to make games. In 2012. 2012. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, that's going to go ahead and start. I'd encourage everyone to move up to these seats. So when Richard asked us to come out here and talk about this, I was on my way to MAU in Vegas. And I was like, sure, we've got plenty of time. We're coming up on a lunch in July, but I think I can squeeze it in. <laughs> and, uh, and then as I was getting back from MAU, uh, we received free tickets to head out to uh, Pocket Gamer Connect in San Francisco. <laughs> so last week, I was scheduling that together and throwing it together and uh, got back from there last night at 9.30 and uh, threw a deck together for tonight. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little uh, last minute, but uh, we uh, hopefully it shares the information that we have and the journey that we've been through. Um, Richard, I'm sorry to inform you that it is not because of the reaction to the <laughs> Bengals <laughs> that the Pangolin has received its own game. But I'm going to go ahead and um, jump into our presentation here. So we're here at Factor Games, like I said, and we started uh, this company with... <coughs> you guys hear that? Is the audio coming through? Yeah, excellent, okay. With Atomadoodle. Atomadoodle was a game that Sarah and I developed on our own. Uh, we did everything from the code, the art, the music, and the lack of marketing that was put into it as well <laughs> was also us. But it's a really great game. Uh, we have really enjoyed playing it. We've enjoyed seeing people's reactions to it. Uh, it's all about the periodic table of elements. It teaches you uh, about the different elements. You have to know the atomic number and the atomic symbol in order to do fusion and fission on the elements as they're running around the board and deliver the appropriate element to the hopper. When you do, you get to unlock the periodic table, and as you unlock the, whole, the table, the levels get harder and harder and harder, mostly just by virtue of the fact that you're dealing with very high numbers and then expected to figure out what do I need to divide and what do I need to add in order to get to the right element, all while you're trying to manage it through this chaotic maze and everything else going on. So we really loved making Atomadoodle. It was a great experience for us. And one of the greatest things that it did was it taught us where we were weak and where we were strong, uh, where we need to improve, where we need to get help, and where we can uh, keep going on and, and doing things well. So we uh, are now developing the Pangolin's Puzzle. And the Pangolin's Puzzle is a, um, it's a step in the right direction for us on, on what we're doing. You can see here that uh, the, it's played on a 2D isometric grid, and this is what's called an Einstein or a classic logic grid puzzle. What you're doing is you're moving the puzzle pieces onto the board, and you've got to get them all into the exact right place in relation to each other and to the rest of the environment. And when you finally do, uh, the level is finished and you move on. It's also a story that's got a very rich, it's a game that's got a very rich story inside of it. We've uh, developed a whole adventure following along uh, Katiti the Pangolin as she's in Africa and our hero Andrew as he goes over into Africa to try to help pangolins. So you might ask yourself, what is a pangolin? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the types of pangolin that exists in the world. Uh, pangolins are very scaly animals. They're, in fact, the only scaly mammal in the world. 
And those scales give it a very unique trait, which is the ability to roll up into an armored ball. Pretty much Samus in animal form here. Yeah, exactly. And that armor there is way tougher than you would expect. It's tougher enough to protect them from lions. These three lions have been batting this pangolin around for a while and try to break through its scales and eat it, but it just can't. It's the most amazing protective uh, covering that any slow mammal like a pangolin could ever <laughs> hope to have. But the unfortunate thing is, is when it rolls around into a ball like that, humans just pick it up, throw it in a sack and walk off. And because of multiple reasons, but the easy poaching of them, they have become the world's most trafficked animal. And they are basically being eaten into extinction. And if you're like me, when we started developing this game, nobody knows they exist. I did not have any idea about penguins uh, before we started developing this game. But it's not all bad news. First of all, penguins are incredibly cute. And uh, <laughs> there are a lot of people out there that are fighting to save them from extinction and to battle those people who are currently engaged in poaching and smuggling them to the various places where they're being sent. There was actually a really cool um, show on BBC Earth just a couple days ago. David Attenborough hosted the first show ever about, mam about uh, penguins and really gave them a lot of uh, limelight, which is great. We're really hoping that that will help bring some uh, attention and attraction to the penguin. So now I'm going to introduce or shift off to Sarah, and she's going to talk about the evolution of the penguins puzzle. <laughs> so we've got to start with the primordial ooze phase. We've kind of broken our um, development and project management into different phases as we went back and looked. Uh, the title of our presentation is a pre-launch post-mortem because we have not yet launched the game, and yet we have learned so much from it um, that it really is kind of a post-mortem for us. So, so anyway, with that in mind, we'll carry on. Um, the way this game started, um, you'll learn throughout this presentation that the word simple is not in our vocabulary at all. So this game started as this huge RPG with all these different story elements and um, RPG elements leveling up and tactics, war, combat type stuff, city management, all the stuff that Tim and I wanted to make on our own in like, you know, three weeks and get it out on the store <laughs> or something. So obviously that was not going to happen. Um, but in order to kind of monetize the massive development schedule that we would need to build such a game, we decided we would take one component from that game, um, the city management component, and break it into its own kind of small game to monetize that and also to build some of the code base that we would need to, uh, to build that city management. Um, the basic uh, puzzle we were working with is the Einstein puzzle, or the logic grid puzzle. Uh, does everybody know what those are? Have you played anything like that? Um, Raise your hand if you've played an Einstein puzzle or a logic grid puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the only experience you have. Well, you might have played them like in grade school. Um, you have a grid, and on one side you have names like Sally and Joe, and on the other, on the top you have, uh, you know, red T-shirts, green T-shirts, purple T-shirts. You know, so Sally's not wearing a green T-shirt, but she's standing next to Joe, who's wearing either a purple or a red T-shirt, and you have to figure out, you know, who's wearing what and who likes to stand next to who. I don't know if that rings a bell or not. Well, anyway, we took that kind of puzzle and um, put our little twist on it, and that was what this city building component was going to become. Um, we prototyped that out, fairly simple to prototype, since there's no real moving parts to it. Um, so we prototyped it all out in Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator, and uh, then we wanted this skin to put on this small game. So we thought, what about a, an interior design game where you would decorate a room with furniture and you would have to fit everyone's criteria and put the furniture in the exact right place and level up as an interior designer. So we, um, we put that together and just something about it was boring. <laughs> we just could not get into the idea. It was going to be marketed to, you know, kind of teenage girls and um, it was just not doing it for us. Uh, we wanted something big to put into it. You had something to add, Tim? Yeah, there were a few restrictions to that game. Yeah. Uh, one was that, like she said, it was, its market was very, very small. 
so we're kind of limiting our options as far as the scope and the sellability of the game. And mm-hmm. another one was the uh, just the, the lack of anything but that Einstein puzzle inside that game. So. Yeah, so that's all it was, was just a collection of puzzles, and we really like games for the strategic elements involved, so it just wasn't cutting it for us. So we decided we'd add at least some strategy, maybe a little economy, maybe a story, and we came up with this choose-your-own-adventure game, um, which we are calling the mind game uh, in this slide here. And um, so that had this real involved story, and but it kind of lost sight of the Einstein puzzle. So we decided, no, that's not going to work either. So we have to come back to uh, the basics. Um, we came back to the interior designer game idea, and we thought, what if we put an interesting spin on it? Like rather than you know teenage girls, we have uh, these cool animals that no one's ever heard about. Um, a long time ago, I'm, I'm also an artist and a sculptor, so a long time ago I had put together this kind of like sculpture product line of these animals that are either endangered or like really weird and no one likes them because they're ugly or stinky or you know grumpy and they can't be kept in zoos, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I pulled that old list out and was like, this is awesome. We could make these cool animals that are so picky and hate each other and, and yet they need their furniture put into a room so they can live in a zoo or they need to be put next to each other without fighting or something like that. So that's where the, the nobody's favorites concept really came from. Um, that. So we, we liked that skin, we decided we'd move forward with it. And finally, um, the next phase we went into was the bloat phase, um, which we, we used a lot of research to kind of justify bloating the project. <laughs> um, so of course we had to figure out, well, what animals are going to be in this game? They have to be compelling, but they have to be adequately weird. Um, so we researched, uh, along with our writer and a couple of our artists, we researched um, 300 some animals honed that list down to 120, which was like an extremely difficult decision because they're all so cool. And then we had to come up with our top 60 because we still wanted to make the game in a reasonable time frame. Um, One thing I'm noticing that's not here real quick, mm -hmm. uh, before the research actually got going, we had uh, built the game in Unity and got the puzzle Whole, the whole puzzle mechanic working and flowing and, and showing through. Mm -hmm. So at this point we had a prototype board game uh, version that she'd made in Illustrator. We had prototyped the game in Unity. We'd seen the, mm -hmm. the, the puzzles working great, put multiple puzzles together, and we were, we were now working with this theme of what we were going to, to put these Einstein puzzles inside of. Yep. Um, and of course we still couldn't just leave it at just a list of puzzles, so we wanted to add some of that story back in there. Um, we used all these 60 animals and we used all the research we had done with them and assigned them these personalities and uh, relationships and things like that that they could uh, have some stories develop. You would play a puzzle, unlock a story chapter, and that would lend you to have more pieces for the next puzzle, and that would be kind of how that economy, very basic economy, would start working. Um, but still, we were like, it's still missing something. There, there's just something that's out of balance, out of whack in all this. So we decided, well, why not look at um, not only what's going on in these animals' personal little enclosures with all their furniture that they need, but let's back up and see what's going on in the whole zoo. These animals don't like each other. There's predators, there's prey animals, there's stinky animals, and there's animals that hate stinky. And, you know, there's all these things going on. So how can we gamify that? How can we add some strategy and a reason for an economy to exist in this game? Um, so you can see we uh, went headlong into another big strategy component. And then you want to add something else? Yeah, I'll add something in. So <laughs> we had, uh, we had the, the, the Einstein puzzle working, and so mm -hmm. now we had this extra bit we had to add in. So we took that same engine and we developed this zoo real-time strategy. And we have yeah. this real-time strategy section going on in the game. Uh, you're able to move entire habitats back and forth inside the zoo and manage chaos as you're going through. Mm -hmm. And we're building up this, uh, this prototype as we go along. So that's going along kind of in conjunction with the research here that we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I'm just gonna go ahead. So we spent four months doing that. We spent, and along at the same time, we spent four months defining the art style that was within our team's capabilities of how we were gonna make this happen. Yeah. And you can see here that this is getting more, that this is more about the mistakes that we're making <laughs> than it is about the right choices that we're making. Uh, we're constantly trying to make things too big. We're constantly dealing with a, a great big thing and, uh, and trying to turn it into something more versus doing the things that we, we should have been doing at that point in time. 
but don't worry, we learn from our mistakes and, and we'll show it as we go through. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, the, the, zoo, the, the zoo strategy game was really interesting. You had all these animals who were um, making messes in their cages, who were getting in fights with each other. Uh, there were like pests and vermin that were coming in and you had to have all the animals were, they were taking care of each other's enclosures and trying to build friendships that way. And it was so, it, it, was, it was really fun, but uh, yeah. It was bloat. <laughs> we entered crisis phase after that. Um, we had several things go wrong all at one time, really. Um, it was really a hard time. We had, first of all, our lead artist. We'd spent four months trying to develop this art style, and she was awesome. She was such a good artist. And then she decided she didn't want to be an artist anymore. <laughs> Complete life change. So she quit. Um, we also had another art intern. Um, who was helping us with some of this, but she had some major, major family crises that were going on just to... Uh, and was only part-time as was well. Was only part-time. It just mm -hmm. wasn't, wasn't feasible for her to be the, the main artist. Yeah, so yeah. really, we, we found very quickly that uh, art is a, a large, time-consuming component of any game. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. So artists, a good artist who can work quickly and do the job that you need them to do is extremely important. And we lost both of our artists. Um, so I had to take on the role of the lead artist um, in addition to all the other hats that I was wearing at the time. So so this is going on right at XPO. This right is at when XPO. we were at XPO yep. this year. We're, <laughs> we're in time, that's where we're at. Uh-huh, yeah. So um, I threw together all the art assets for XPO in one week, and I thought I was going to die. And I was like, how am I going to keep this up for <laughs> the entire development schedule? In addition to making all the puzzles and uh, managing all these processes and everything, it was, uh, it was intense. Mm -hmm. um, looking at my realistic capabilities and the realistic capabilities of all the developers and everyone, we said, uh-oh, this game's going to take us two years to develop, and we need income like yesterday, so what are we going to do? That was another huge crisis that we had to face was, uh, again, figuring out that the project had gotten way too big. Um, also, that all this cool strategy and chaos management and everything that we put into the game, it was not gelling with that Einstein puzzle. Um, the Einstein puzzle was just very slow and thoughtful, and then you had this chaotic game um, in the background that was trying to work with it, and they just were clashing. and. It wasn't working, and the problem there was that the Einstein puzzle was the only component of this game that we had really tested with a large audience, that we really had a good good feel for. The strategy was very basic, and we hadn't really figured out how to make that work, so we were left back with just the Einstein puzzle again, working in all this mess. So that's where I kind of stepped in uh, and said, <laughs> okay, project management time, what we've got to look at here. We've got this entire game kind of spread out across a real-time strategy component. We've got our solid Einstein puzzle that we've been working on here. We've got to make some changes. We've got to figure out how to how to cut this out. So is it on the next slide where we talk about, uh, do you want to yeah. go ahead? Oh no, um, the oh, last point, there, yeah, okay. the last point that I was having trouble here was um, I was having a great difficulty uh, fitting an Einstein puzzle into a story. So before we had just used this Einstein puzzle with kind of random elements, furniture, or you know things like that that didn't really matter to a story, you could change a sofa without changing the story. But at this point, we had actually started to use the Einstein puzzle to bring in, um, well, story components. It's, it's hard to describe without you actually playing the game, but the, the pieces in the game were starting to really impact how the story was being told. Um, the layout of the puzzle was starting to impact how the story was being told. And so all these extra restrictions were coming on me from designing puzzles. So no longer could I design a whole breadth of just, you know, simple puzzles and get them out of the way. Now I had to put a lot of effort into developing these, these really well thought out puzzles that integrated with the story. So that was coming to, coming to find out, whereas I can put together a general puzzle in, you know, a couple of them a day. It was taking me two weeks just to put together one stinking puzzle for this game. So that was also a huge crisis for us. And then you can, I don't know if you wanted to, to take up where you left off, Tim. So yeah, at that point, that's where we decided, okay, we've got 60 animals and we need to pare this down to just five. And obviously, <laughs> like I said, that's where we were at with the XPO when we were at mm -hmm. the XPO. We had the five animals inside there. We had the logic puzzle inside the office. And that was great. Um, but when we compare with all the different things that were going on, this game was still too big. 
So I made the decision that we needed to hone everything down to one animal. We need to make a story around one animal and get that logic puzzle going forward that way. Mm -hmm. And so that's the point when we chose the pangolin as the animal that we were going to go forward with. And this is going to be the, the reasoning behind making the pangolin's puzzle at this point is, first of all, we, we want to make a game about the pangolin, but we need to get <laughs> something out there uh, that can introduce the players to the world of nobody's favorites and introduce the players to the gameplay of nobody's favorites. And so that's what the Pangolins Puzzles game became. This is our this is our uh, prequel, if you will. <laughs> this is our, 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 our first launch game that we're mm -hmm. making. Uh, so as we had been developing the Pangolins Puzzle, we had absolutely fall, I, I, I'm sorry, as we had been developing nobody's favorites, we absolutely fell in love with the Pangolin. Mm -hmm. It was just a fascinating creature to all of us that none of us had heard about before. Its story was just, terrible being the world's most trafficked animal being eaten into extinction mm -hmm. scales being used and used for eastern medicine uh, we follow different news sites and it's constantly coming up five tons of pangolin scales found in shipment on its way to china i mean if you can imagine five tons of scales on that little animal uh, it's just uh, terrible to think about mm -hmm. and so we wanted all of our games to have some sort of real world impact as well we always try to tie them into decisions that we're making in the game are positive decisions that we would be making in the real world. So it just really made it had a really good impact for us. It was relevant, it was now, and it was raising awareness around something that nobody knew, knew about. Mm -hmm. Plus, the Penguins Puzzle is just a great name. It's got <laughs> puzzle in the title, it's got alliteration, it doesn't seem forced or contrived. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything about it to us was just a, a great way to go forward. Mm -hmm. So at this point, this is where we decide we're putting the zoo game aside, we're putting nobody's favorites with the five animals aside, we're focusing on this one game with this story and moving forward that way. So, do you want to talk about learning to, uh, yeah, to manage? To let go and manage, yeah. yeah. So that's that's the other big uh, decision that we made, is that Tim and I, uh, we had started to get this team uh, put together. Um, I started to eat some humble pie and realize that I can't do all things. <laughs> given the time frame that we were working in. And so we were like, okay, we need to get an actual artist. Uh, we need to get uh, music and sound put into this game. All these things that, you know, traditionally Tim and I had just done on our own. Um, and so we, we did end up finding a really amazing artist, uh, works out of Dallas, a full-time job, and then works for us on the side and does just amazing, amazing work. Uh, we also found a music and sign des sound designer who also is an animator. So that worked out really well in our favor. Um, and then we also started to retask our interns um, before they were doing simple projects, concept art only. Uh, but we actually found jobs that they could do with their skill sets um, that really complemented the game and, uh, and helped our time schedules. So we really started to trust our people and started to figure out what their real capabilities were and started to use them and, um, and rely on them and learn to actually become managers and step back uh, and learn the process of you don't just throw a whole ton of things on, a, on an employee and then leave. You gradually take yourself out of the picture. So we had to learn all these management skills all at that same time as well. It was all happening very slowly too. Yeah. We would have a part-time employee come to help code. And so we would slowly start to, to delegate code to that person. And then we had a full-time employee come to help code. And we delegated more authority and decision-making to him. And as over that time, that slowly turned into something now where Peter, our lead developer, uh, is completely managing the code. I have not touched code at this point in over four months. Yeah. Coming from being the only developer in our company to not touching the code at all in less than a year has been just a drastic change. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I haven't managed projects before and not coding, but in the context of this game and in the context of, uh, of what we're doing here, it was a uh, it was an interesting journey, along with everything else that was going on as well. Yeah. Um, and so t to mention that, so we've, we've got this game now, we've developed Nobody's Favorites, we've developed this zoo, we've put four months into researching the world of Nobody's Favorites and all these animals, giving them all stories, relationships, four levels of relationships, <laughs> archetypes. Uh, unlockables. Un unlockables, all these different things that we have researched and put into with our story writer. Um, so, Two things came out of that. The first, oh, sorry, one other thing we had was uh, all of Sarah's board game prototypes that right. she had put together. So we started going back and looking at those things, and we saw that the board game prototype had always been fun, and we took what was in the board game prototype for the zoo, 
and left the Einstein puzzle away and we said this actually is fun just on its own so there's a guy in town uh, Mike Sikora who's a good friend of ours and we said hey can you take this game and flesh it out and he's he a said board yeah game developer. he's a board game developer so mm -hmm. he said yeah so he took that game he fleshed it made a prototype pen and paper prototype of that game that was fleshed out and, and great and so that is a single player version but it was a great fun game to play and we really enjoyed the strategy so we tasked him further with turning it into a multiplayer game and now at this point uh, nobody's favorites the board game has turned into a two to four hour uh, two to four player game that is currently getting ready to be made into an actual game maker send it off to game maker to have an actual real gameplay printed as soon as we finish off with a little bit more prototyping and as you can see I kind of skipped the bullet but we had a friend uh, his name's Kent and he told us a mentor actually years ago never throw away anything you can use and never give away anything you can sell mm -hmm. And so that's where that whole idea of getting that board game coming out of, and it's turned out to be super positive for us. We've mm -hmm. got this other game going on now. Mm -hmm. And then while we were kind of adopting to this new management style inside the company, bringing all these employees on slowly, uh, we Sarah w was able to take everything that we had done, all that research that we had, and bring it together in a much simplified shell. And now we have a full design ready to go for prototyping and development of a mobile game that incorporates all of that data but in a very simple reasonable way that we're very happy with it's so just an einstein puzzle again <laughs> well it's just an einstein puzzle but we took a lot of the the classic mobile things there's a mm -hmm. quest system built into it mm -hmm. um there is leveling up of the animals but it's basically just done out of the the questing and the jobs and the and the solution to the einstein puzzles that you get and there's not a real-time strategy component where you, you manage a zoo and do all these other things inside of there. That was farmed out to the board game. Mm -hmm. So the board game has all of that, and the mobile game has uh, more of all the relational type things that we wanted to get in, mm -hmm. all encompassing that core of an Einstein puzzle. Mm -hmm. So they turned out to be very synergistic. So rather than releasing one product in a year, we'll have three products to release in a year, which is amazing. Yeah. So... With that, we can introduce our team. Looks like we have oh, lots of... you're going back there. You have to do it one at a time. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, oh. Wrong direction. Okay, so starting with development, um, I just want to say thank you to Richard in Techlahoma. <laughs> we, uh, we threw this... Um, didn't expect to, to find a, a developer that we needed, uh, but we took a, a, an ad, a, a, what we needed, our job description, and put it on Techlahoma and Peter found us and it has mm -hmm. just been the greatest blessing for us as a team mm -hmm. that I can imagine. Peter came from PlayStation Studio that was working on um, Mag4, Unit 13, um, and a couple other games and uh, has come and is now the lead developer at our studio mm -hmm. and that has just totally, totally changed the opportunities, allowed me to step back out of development and really step into the management role. Mm -hmm. Uh, Josh Veit is a developer out of OSU who is working for us. He's uh, part-time during the school year and full-time during the summer and during the, the winter. So he's been an amazing uh, asset to us as well, uh, mostly working on the UI, but he's also been building all of our cutscenes now, which uh, I can't wait to, to show everybody sometime soon. So Taylor Townsley was the first person that came to us. She's our writer and our social media person and has been doing all the story arc and everything going on inside the game. She's largely responsible for all of that work we talked about with the relationships and mm -hmm. um, just everything that goes into defining those animals and who they are and what they are in this world of nobody's favorites. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk about the art team? Sure. Um, Rose Miller is our lead artist. She works at Ice Station in Dallas um, and she is a workhorse. She has cranked out all the art that you see on the, the screen later that you've seen already. Uh, so just an incredible artist and she worked really fast and uh, taught me the difference between, you know, lower skilled artists and high skilled artists. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, Tessa Waddell is uh, an intern um, artist who also works part time. She's also a student at uh, Tulsa Tech, actually. So that's how we found her. Um, and she's been doing an excellent job. She's been a concept artist. She did all the art for the Nobody's Favorites concept with all, you know, the person surrounded by all those animals. That was all her work. Um, she's done fantastic. And now we have her actually taking Rose's artwork and turning it into little uh, 
I guess, like puppets that are animated on the screen. So she's, um, that was one of the ways we found to really plug her in and help her to be. If I can stop there, that's, that's a really cool transition for what we had to learn to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Tessa is a concept artist. She is just full of ideas. She, Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if any of you saw, uh, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, uh, but Goo would just spit out Imaginary Friends, right? That's Tessa. Yeah. She's just throwing out ideas right and left, and it's just wonderful to have her on the team and generate all those ideas. So she did all the concepts for the characters, and then those got shipped off to Rose, mm-hmm. and Rose would take those characters and flesh out two or three different versions and give them to us. We'd choose which one we wanted to use, and put it, and that would become the main puppet or the main drawing for, character drawing for the game. Mm-hmm. And then those got sent back to Tessa. And Tessa (laughs) took those and made the little actors that are inside the game. So our game has two basic representations of every character. One that's doing the dialogue that you Mm -hmm. see in any classic, uh, you know, dialogue system. And then down inside the scene, the characters are running around animated doing their own thing. And so Tessa got to end up being the one making all those animated characters Mm -hmm. down inside the scene, which has just been a really cool process to watch unfold before our eyes uh, in this system. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And then uh, the musician and sound designer and also animator is Chris Hendricks, uh, who did work with, I guess he came up with the um, Penguin Club, Club Club Penguin, Penguin, and uh, worked for Disney for a while and worked with, uh, who else did he work with? Uh, Hyper Hippo. Hyper Hippo. I believe. Yeah. yeah, so he's doing uh, the animation, the music, and sound, and is just amazing addition to our team as well. He's pretty much a genius and uh, helps us with design and all kinds of other tasks. So we are extremely proud of our team. Um, that is one of the points that if you don't leave here with anything else, leave here with this, that um, it is there is no shame in getting other people to help you with your project. And if you do, choose good people. Um, it is a world above choosing, you know, someone who's cheap and trying to make them work well. <laughs> Choose someone who's good, who knows what they're doing, and uh, and who jives well as a team. And oh my goodness, it's just such a blessing to have people who can work like that. Yeah, I was gonna say, as far as project management goes, and that's something I've learned for a while, is that your team has to think of each other largely like a family. Mm-hmm. And this team, I've this team is amazing. They. They're constantly complimenting each other, helping each other, mm-hmm. commenting Critiquing. on each other, mm-hmm. critiquing posit- positively. It's just uh, they gel together so well. Mm-hmm. If, uh, it's a, it, like she said, it's a huge blessing. Yep. And we'll talk more about that later. That it, that's certainly a big takeaway that we wanted to discuss in detail. But uh, we're also looking now for a lead QA uh, person to help with our testing as we build up to launch. We're currently interviewing some people, so we have not filled that role yet. Um, so now we are full on in development phase uh, where the crises have stopped really, but uh, now management is the huge hungry beast that we're feeding. So um, whereas I used to be you know, the artist, the puzzle designer and storyboarder and all this stuff, and I still am, uh, I'm now spending between 50% and 80% of my time in any given week managing all my team and you know building uh, templates for them to follow and documentation for them to follow and keeping up with them and reviewing their work and making sure everything is facilitated so i did not understand going into this how much of a uh, of a job that is how big of a job we also have team members who are working at all hours of the day um, in all areas of the country we have one in canada and one in dallas Uh, We have people who work full-time job um, starting at 6 in the morning and people who don't start working until 6 in the evening, and I have to keep up with all these people. So it's been quite a challenge to kind of shift gears and become a manager uh, in addition to doing everything else I need to do. Yeah, so I I wanted to talk about that for a little bit too. Um, So I came from a management background uh, working with apps, mobile apps, and so that's where I, I was at before we started Hero Factor Games, and I thought that a lot of that was going to translate really, really, really well to game de- development. <laughs> and some of it does uh, for me, but honestly, we've been through, so we've, we've have Automadoodle on the market. Before we made Automadoodle, we designed uh, four or five games, and every process that we went through for that was different. And I didn't really, it didn't gel in my head until we started getting this team together and actually managing this team the way we're, we're moving forward that 
everything is totally different depending on the game. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to adapt and kind of see how these different things gel together. You know, with two of your artists being part-time and one of your coders being part-time and another one being full-time living in Canada or, or wherever they may be, in order for us to be efficient and get everything done right, we can't set a 8.30 Monday scrum meeting mm -hmm. and expect everybody to show up. It's just not gonna work. And so we have to figure out how to, how to manage that team and how to put processes together that include the artists being able to talk to the developers even though they're in different uh, you know, daytime type things and using emails is just not gonna work, right? It's too slow and it's too clunky. Um, so getting processes put together that allow us to develop these games uh, the way we want to has been very challenging. And I think the thing that I'm seeing the most come out of it for me, at any rate, is that every game has a different process mm -hmm. through it. And maybe that's different if you're a AAA studio and you've got a constant set of teams, you know, all your developers are full-time, all your artists are full-time. They're all, you know, have been in game design or, or art design for X number of years. Um, but when you're dealing with people coming from all sorts of walks of life, some part-time, some full-time, some in school, some not, uh, it's a it's just a challenge to come up with the right way to put that team together and get it, it running like a weld oil machine. Mm -hmm. And also, for the first time ever in Pangolin's Puzzle, we have no game design document. <laughs> We've designed probably 20 or 30 games, all with different iterations and types of game design documents that we've put together, from a full-blown classic game design document to just notepad documents mm -hmm. describing different sections of the games, uh, to what we call creative documents that are meant to describe the user experience before we do anything else. We have all that kind of stuff and we've, we've been developing processes for all of that. And for this one, there was no time. There was no way we could put together a game design document, keep our game design team flowing, keep our art team towing, flowing, and get things done at a reasonable rate. Mm -hmm. So now the game design document for Pangolin's Puzzle is taking the form primarily of storyboards. Uh, we've got what, are you using PowerPoint still? No, I mean, I use Photoshop to put together all the different components into a storyboard and then export each one as a JPEG in frames, and it's extremely tedious, but it's, yeah. it works. It does the job. <laughs> There's other ways to put it together, but that's been the, that's been the one that the developers that are building the cutscenes uh, can then take that information, put it, to put it the way they need, and then Taylor does a script. Mm -hmm. So the majority of our game design document, like I said, between that storyboard and between that script, of course, the developers have documents in different places to describe systems that are in play, uh, especially as they grow more complicated. We, we go back and make sure that those things are there so that everybody knows what's going on. But as far as being able to use a, an actual document for this game, uh, like I said, it, just, it has not been realistic for us to do so. And that works for us because our game is very story heavy mm -hmm. and the puzzle mechanic is not super... Um, versatile or variable, so we don't need extremely intense uh, design documents describing the mechanic that basically doesn't change throughout the game. So for a different type of project, like you said, um, every, every project is different. You might need a much more involved design document for different projects. Um, the other thing that I've been learning is uh, with a good team that works really well like we have now, um, it has been a scramble to try and stay ahead of them in all this documentation and all these, basically supplying them with the resources they need to do an awesome job. And that's pretty much my full-time job now. But staying ahead of them is really, really hard uh, because they work so fast and they work so well. And so what we're doing now is designing um, the next two games. I'm doing that kind of in my spare time at home to try and stay ahead of these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he wrote the 90-10 the rule here, which is 90% of my time goes into Penguin's Puzzle, and the rest of the 10% of my time, um, including my sleep time, goes into Nobody's Favorites and trying to prepare that project so that it is ready for development to really sink their teeth into when they have it, yep. when they have the time to do it. Who here is an indie developer? Raise your hand if you're actually developing a game right now. On, on, are you on your own? Are you with people? Okay. Totally on your own? Yeah, so I mean, you guys know exactly how many hats you wear, right? Yeah. I went through the other day and created a list of all the jobs that are in the company for this game alone, and it was 30 unique jobs <laughs> that need to be done, right? Full-time so, jobs. Full-time <laughs> jobs, yeah. This, at our, if, we're, if we're being run right, we'd at least have some of them being part-time, but the majority of them would be full-time. And so uh, especially somebody like Sarah, who's the creative director, the storyboarder, the puzzle designer, the level designer, 
uh, and doing all of this intense work. And then on top of that, she's got to figure out how to squeeze in managing the employees, being super efficient and being agile all at the same time has been a, a, a real challenge. And so I, I try to, my, my job largely is to try to remove stress from her <laughs> as much as possible, take it where I can and move it to somewhere else. Uh, and, that, and so with that in mind, we're, we're outsourcing art, we're outsourcing logo design, we're outsourcing other sorts of things like that mm -hmm. that, can, that need to be done. They're critical, but we've got to take them off our shoulders. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, Though, along with that, we're outsourcing all of our art design for our, our trailers and, and things like that. All that's going to be totally taken off her shoulders so she doesn't have to worry about it. So why don't you launch us into learning how to sell the game? And the yeah, launch. so learning how to sell a game, that's been so... <laughs> Uh, that's our our biggest weakness as a company it has been and I think it's a pretty common indie story uh, mm -hmm. to struggle with the selling of a game especially I mean maybe you know seven years ago selling a game ten years ago it was a lot easier than it is today uh, but today uh, we're seeing all of the money I think it, I just read an article today it's either 70 or 80 percent of the money in the games world is now in mobile mobile games world is going to the big AAA shops uh, because they've all started moving in so we're talking about a 28 billion dollar industry and we want to take a small part of that piece of that pie and it doesn't seem like a big deal <laughs> 28 billion dollars there should be a piece of the pie left over for me right even if it's only crumbs i'm good <laughs> but you know now you're talking about you're you're dealing with only 20 maybe 30 percent of that pie that you get to try to take a slice out of so there's a bunch of different methodologies for selling games. I'm not good at it. I haven't done it successfully yet. I uh, have worked with a Tomadoodle and learned a lot about what we did not do. Um, I've been blessed to be a part of some email groups that are full of guys who do this successfully all day long, and I just sit and watch. I'm, I don't speak, I don't ask unless I absolutely need to, and I just listen to these CEOs talk about the challenges that they have as Google does what it does or as Facebook does what it does. How do we market our games? But the primary thing I have learned is that, you know, of course there's all of the free indie ways of doing it, but uh, pretty much Facebook and Google make up eight out of the 10 top biggest used apps uh, that are measuring what people are doing out of selling games. Uh, they're called the, the duopoly. Uh, you can, if you want to sell games at scale, Facebook and Google is where 70 to 80 percent of the money that you're going to spend is going to go. And so that's what we're right now doing is stepping into a campaign of raising money to sell Pangolin's Puzzle uh, and to try to get that going. Um, I've always, like I said, I've been paying attention to these these groups for about a year and a half now and trying to absorb what they're doing. And I've been getting more and more of a picture of which companies we might want to partner with, uh, you know, who we might want to use for ad mediation, who we might want to use for uh, ad buys, who we might want to use for incorporating ads into our game if we want to do that and figuring out which ones actually make sense with our company and what we're doing. Uh, but I recently went to uh, MAU in Vegas, uh, Mobile Apps Unlocked, and that taught me a ton, uh, honestly. Being at that convention, uh, if you haven't been to any conventions on selling games and you want to go to a convention on marketing of mobile games, I highly suggest MAU mm -hmm. uh, if you can possibly attend. It was, uh, yeah, it was it was very nice. And everybody there that I was talking to um, was saying the, the same thing. I think I sat next to the manager of acquisition at, or marketing at Time Warner and he said the exact same thing. I go to con I go to conventions every year, and this one is by far the best one I've been to as far as learning about marketing. So it doesn't matter what scale you're at. You're guys like us who are trying to throw pennies at marketing our games, and you've got guys like him that are throwing billions at marketing their games. Uh, still, this place is turning out to be a, a huge uh, benefit to everything that they're doing. Um, so yeah, that's that's our goal right now is to uh, to properly market our game on Facebook and, and Twitter mm -hmm. and uh, see what we can get going. And so we're currently getting into beta and launch. Our beta is coming up on June 11th. That's when we're slated to go into full beta. Our game's got about two and a half hours of gameplay inside of it. And uh, we're gonna be selling it for probably $399, $299 or $399, somewhere around in there. That's our current, uh, current guess at what we're doing. And launch should be in late July. So we've got basically about a month to get, yeah, 10 weeks to get everything finished and polished off. 
which is scary. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're moving forward. The mo- almost all of everything is done for the game. All the puzzles are designed. Everything's put in. Uh, we've got to do some special effects and things like that before we send out the first beta. And then we've got to do a polish phase on all the art. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's where we're at with that right now. I'm getting to that launch. Yep. So after everything we just talked about, I'm going to summarize uh, these products that we currently have. So we have the Penguins Puzzle. It's in development right now. It's finishing development, and it's um, going to be launched this summer. It's a prequel to the Nobody's Favorites world. It kind of sets up this whole Nobody's Favorites world in which uh, these animals come to stay with this zookeeper. And this is the game that we were telling you about, the mobile game that Sarah's been developing with 10% of her time as she's going forward, so that we're ready to hit the ground running with development of it as soon as we're done with Pangolin's Puzzle, which is great. We've never been in that position before, and it's been a very... uh, very beneficial thing for us to be there and then there's the nobody's favorites board game which is a companion piece to the nobody's favorites mobile game and we're hoping to build in a little bit of interaction between the two of them we don't have it designed but it seems like a very natural fit for us so that's a that's where we're at with those games well that's our presentation for today um, we like I said we kind of threw this together at the last minute um, love to talk to you in more detail about any of that stuff that we talked about. Mm-hmm. There's just so much, um, so much to say on each of the different topics. Yeah. So what we really wanted to say is, do you guys have any questions? Uh, if you want more on project management, you can ask us anything. More on art, uh, more on code, more on storyboarding, more on yeah. the creative. Yeah. What are you interested? Yeah. What are you Choose interested in? <laughs> we'll answer whatever. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, so the question was, uh, in today's mobile space, the expectation for most users is that the game will be free and that there will be microtransactions inside the game, a freemium model. And what we described that we're doing with the Pangolins Puzzle is a premium model where you pay for it when you download it and maybe you pay for stuff later, maybe you don't. In our case, you don't. Um, so. How did we come to that decision? Was it from third party input or was it from our own decisions? So the freemium model is, it's fairly standardized within the industry. Uh, When you're gonna make a freemium model game, uh, you're gonna have microtransactions in it, usually to support some sort of economy that's going on inside that game. Uh, When we developed the Penguins puzzle beginning, we were gonna have it be a freemium game. That was the, that was the, the model we were moving for. But when we made Pangolin's Puzzle, Pangolin's Puzzle had this very, very rich story that was inside of it. And that story, like Sarah was talking about earlier, made the puzzle designs be tightly integrated Mm -hmm. into the story. Where you were at in the story completely determined what what the puzzle was going to be about, and everything was moving forward that way. And another thing was that we are looking at the Pangolin's Puzzle as a prequel or kind of an introductory thing to to this world. So we don't want to develop it, and we don't want it to be infinite. We want it to have a beginning of a story and an end of a story. We also don't have an economy inside this game. It's just a a game, an adventure game, about Andrew going on this adventure and Katiti going on this adventure. So I could probably give a whole talk just on what makes up a freemium game uh, versus a premium game. But freemium games, uh, if you want to have microtransactions built into your game, they need to be built into the game loop. The core game loop of the game, if you try to slap something on it at the end, whether it be a rewarded ad or uh, having an economy or whatever it may be, uh, if you just try to slap something like that on the end, it's not going to work out. It's going to fail. So all all around together, this game didn't support that. We could try to work it in there and get something to be that way, uh, but it just doesn't doesn't support the freemium model. Uh, The next game that we'll do will support the freemium model. Uh, we're not going to do it in quite the normal way, um, but that can answer that question. 
Slightly. There are two books I would suggest that you read. Um, well, actually, there are a few things I would suggest you do. To understand the freemium model more and then look back at why we didn't choose it, uh, there's a blog called Mobile Dev Memo by Eric Sweefer. Uh, he's now the user acquisition expert at Network Games, I do believe. Um, his work in the freemium space has been probably the most influential thing in my understanding of the freemium model and what it takes to run it successfully. Um, so yeah, please go out and read uh, Mobile Dev Memo. It is a fantastic resource for every one of us. Mobile Dev Memo, yep. Uh, there's also another book, and I, I apologize to the author, I can't remember the, the author's name right at the moment, but it's called Free to Play. And if you haven't read Free to Play, it is a fantastic game all about the freemium game, what makes it work, and, and how it works. Um, how, to, how to market it, how to build it into your loop, how to handle all these different things. Um, and I could get it, like I said, I could get into the freemium game model. I don't think that our company will ever develop a freemium game under the way that it's currently done and successful. Um, and I could give a whole talk on the, the reason for that. Uh, but basically, when we sell a game, we want to set a price point of what it's worth to us. So we look at a game, we've developed it, we know how much it's worth, and when our customers come to buy from us, they know we're never gonna charge them more than X dollars for this game. Uh, so in this case, you know you're never gonna pay more than $3.99 for the game. Once you buy it, you're done. Uh, in the other games that we're making that do have a free-to-play model, uh, we're, we've worked to integrate in ways that we can have an offer wall at you know 10% into the game, and when you get to that wall, we tell our users, hey, you can either pay for the whole game now, unlock the whole thing, and you'll pay 10 bucks, or if you want to unlock it by paying as you go and releasing little bits of it, you'll never pay more than 15 bucks. That's just an example. But uh, the mic, the, and that is technically freemium, but even that does not fit what I would call the freemium model. It's just not, and it's just not the way we do business. That's a kind of a core tenant to our, our business philosophy, business model. And the price itself, the three ninety nine was uh, bounced off of several industry people. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to mention that. Thank you mm -hmm. for reminding me. Uh, so I went to Pocket Gamer this weekend mm -hmm. or this last week, uh, which was another great, um, great convention. Uh, thank you to Simon for putting it on. It was. Uh, I met so many people, had so many opportunities to network with different publishers, investors game designers, just all sorts of different people there, and, and pretty much the point of it was to network with people and uh, find out who's, uh, you know, is a good connection where. Um, and through that, I got to do the big, in, big, the very big indie pitch. I got to do um, uh, what we call the speed pitch, which was where we pitch our games and our companies to um, publishers and investors, and mm -hmm. then I got to do the mentee mentor time where they, pat, they m match you up us, a developer, with somebody that's been successful in the industry. Uh, so we got to meet a, a wide variety of people with a ton of success. And we showed them our game, we showed them what we're doing, uh, showed them the video that you saw earlier about the game, talked to them about the premium model, talked to them about the price point, and 100% agreement that it's the right way to go forward with this particular game and that there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to, to sell this game that way. Given the quality of the art and the quality of the the gameplay that we've put together, um, it seemed like a good model for this particular game, which was really great confirmation because, you know, in the mobile space, not doing freemium is rare. There are good examples of it. Uh, the Room is a great example of a sold game. What's that? Such a good game. Yeah, <laughs> it's a wonderful game. Uh, and then you've got, you know, the Laura Craft Go and Deus Ex Go or other examples of games that are not good using the freemium model. And they're all running about the same playtime. Some of them are higher, up upwards of five hours, but a lot of them are in the two to two and a half hour playtime range mm -hmm. for three to four bucks. And so that's kind of where we're sitting to, which was more confirmation for us. Yep. Yeah. Other questions? Awesome. Yeah. Uh, how are you funding projects? Private investors. Private Question was, yep. how are we funding the projects? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> how are we funding the projects? Private yep. investors. Yep. Private investors. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so the question was, uh, basically, what inspiration do we give to our creatives, especially our writer, um, to tell them this is how, this is the direction we want to take the story or the creative work? And boy, the answer to that question is so varied. Um, it depends on the project. For this project, it was actually other games that inspired the writing. Um, so Fire Emblem is one of my all-time favorite series, and that really inspired this funny little game about animals. But uh, our luckily our writer, that's one of her favorite games too. And so we were like, yeah, let's, let's pull some things in from Fire Emblem, how they have these quirky relationships that go on and bring out a lot of humor. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of other inspiration sources, but... A lot of them are other games. Uh, we pick out the games that we really find uh, some component of. We'll say, you know, I really like, uh, for instance, you know, like Banner Saga. I really like how they have these kind of choices that influence the game, but I don't like the darkness of the story. It needs to be brighter and lighter. And so let's look to some of Disney's writing. Yeah, I really like some Disney's writing, and particularly in this film, or uh, a lot of Pixar's writing, we like that. Um, so what I did in the initial pitch to our writer was basically put together a big long list of movies um, to look at, other games that were similar in feel, um, and that brings up a good point. To know where to direct them, I had to have a real good idea of the feel I was going for for this game. So kind of writing down keywords, you know, child-friendly, um, funny, intelligent, witty, uh, not too slapstick, not too gross, um, you know, things like that. Trying to give as many terms and words as possible to get that picture across for the writing. Can I give that back to you? What sort of format do you just give a like, short story or is it like a comic book sort of style? Yeah. So the next question was, what format do I get that back uh, returned to me from the writer? Um, our writer the first thing that she does is make kind of an outline of saying here's some general things that might happen in the story our story is very much dialogue based so there's always you know two or three characters talking so she gives kind of an idea of perhaps the zookeeper thinks about this and needs to have this change happen in his life and I'll say yeah but that's too epic let's tone it down you know or something like that so this outline is always the first thing these rough concepts um, oftentimes I will take the rough concept and I will actually make like a like a, um, a script to say try this try this out this is really what I'm going for this snippet of writing and she'll take that she'll flesh that out she'll add more to it she'll add her own character uh, personalities to it um, we move as quickly as possible towards a script format though since that's the final format of the writing it just makes sense because if she wrote a short story for us then we would have to remo remove a lot of the cues that make a short story work um, so basically outline to my own personal comments to her script is how that has worked out and then finally I take her script and make a storyboard uh, basically animatics so things are moving around in Photoshop um, and that's also kind of my final uh, revision process. Oftentimes when I get the characters on the screen moving around, it, it tells me where things need, be, need to be changed, where things need to be shortened, what doesn't make sense, what needs to be expanded on. So um, getting it into a visual format very quickly is also a great idea for uh, improving that story writing process. Mm -hmm, definitely. So what platforms are we considering in addition to mobile? Yeah, so uh, our primary launch is going to be in July, and that will be mobile, but we're also going to be putting it out on uh, the native app store for Mac and also on Steam. That's our, our secondary target for the launch. Yep. Uh, the, the other question for us in making that decision is that if you look at the size of the game market in the U.S., and Australia and Canada and the UK and you combine them all together they're still about half what it is in China <laughs> uh, so is doing what's necessary to get into China and that game market of a better financial return for us than it is to try to put it out on Steam and and, and drum up the success there that we need um, currently we think it's better to go for Steam first and and maybe break into the East Asia market afterward but uh, a decision isn't fully made and we've got at least another couple months to make that decision before we <laughs> while we launch it off in mobile but mm -hmm. yeah so you have a lot of people and I've had some experience working with 
So our, the question is, uh, since we have lots of remote people and uh, they're distributed around, how do we control uh, version control or working with assets and things like that? Um, there's a couple answers to that question and uh, they're unfortunately probably not everything you're looking for. Um, so what tools we have used has evolved over time. I mean, when we started, we couldn't afford Google and use Google Drive. We, we, we hacked things together with the cheapest thing we could possibly find that had everything we needed. And one of the things that was hardest for us to find was time management in a, in a really cheap way. We ended up finding a very free tool uh, that was great and, and worked for us. But uh, So there's a couple different reasons why uh, that started off in different places. But where we're at today is uh, we use something called Active Collab uh, for project management and time management. Um, we would like to be in some other solutions, but this is the one we're at and it's working pretty well, so we're not going to change that for now. We finally do have Google uh, for managing of all of our art assets and things like that. And as far as versioning of text, documents and things like that, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as code, we use uh, an, an SVN server uh, to manage all of our stuff between uh, the Unity files. And that's primarily the only place where we have any potential for conflict even. Uh, and since we're only on a two-man team, managing the files and different things is not that big of a deal uh, because we have our lead developer generally working on the back end of the code, you know, the things that are driving everything, uh, the tools and the shaders or anything like that, while another developer is working on building the UI mm -hmm. and the cutscenes. And so there's very, very low potential for conflict. Uh, so that's what I'm guessing you're getting at is conflict with code and assets and Unity and things like that. You what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, our, another thing that we use uh, to great effect has been uh, Slack. Yeah. I'd say that the majority of our work is, is done in Slack. Yeah. Just about everything we do is there. And then yeah. when artists are ready to develop or send something to us, a final version, they load it up into their own Google Drive, uh, Drive and we from there disseminate it to the appropriate files. Mm -hmm. uh, the only people that touch the final file locations in a right fashion are generally me or Sarah and uh, as far as art assets and things like that go um, and we have another folder where anybody else can can get in and access things mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, do we have a gameplay video to show do we have a gameplay video to show the w the one that I showed earlier uh, at the very beginning of the slide has some gameplay inside of it So this is all captured from my phone, and I just threw it together onto the screen, um, except for the, the front page there, that's not. So here's some of the gameplay here. You're selecting things from that menu over to the, the left of the screen. And oh. oh, sorry. I was thinking I could pause it. But and then a penguin appeared. It doesn't want to pause. <laughs> a wild penguin appeared. Let me yeah. see if I can just run it here, and that'll let me pause it. So over to the left, you have the, the shelf, is what we call it, and that's where all the puzzle pieces come from. So you're tapping them, they're automatically placed into the game board. You have the ability, uh, in most levels, you can rotate them, remove them off the game board and back into the shelf, or set the check mark to which sets them down in the location. If you see down below here, there's a description of the clues, which you have a limited set of clues that you have to read. That gives you all the logical uh, guidelines into how to correctly assemble all the little pieces onto that grid uh, in the board there. So it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. There's really nothing uh, super groundbreaking about it other than just, you know, the the logic and the way that those pieces implement. Yeah, we only know of one other game that's done a visual Einstein puzzle this way. There are other Einstein puzzle games out on the market that use the, the grid and you use check marks and or X's to mm -hmm. mark the things in the right place. Uh, but the only other one we know about this is uh, Agatha Christie on DS, like back in, I don't know when. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when that one came out, but it's been a while. So. Which I'm sure you've all played. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's isometric 2D. 2D. 
2D uh, graphics. All, yeah. of, all the graphics are, are 2D. Uh, there are four representations of, of any graphic that needs to be rotated. So we're very pers we have sets of rules about when a graphic needs to be given rotations or when it needs to not be given rotations and mm -hmm. whether or not, say for example, um, this set of trees here, sometimes we can get away with having that just be one piece of art and sometimes we have to split each cell into its own piece of art. So there's just different rules and guidelines um, when, when things need to be made mm -hmm. that way. One thing that I wish I could show you here, um, and I do have all sorts of different ways of showing you. I can show you on my phone, and I just don't have a Mac build of uh, this thing. Sarah, can you get my uh, power cord out of here? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Sure thing. Um, is uh, the animations, has it, have any of you guys worked with Spine? The very last Spine 2D. Okay, so Spine 2D absolutely blew my mind when we started using it, and it still blows my mind uh, whenever I show it to people. Um, which which cell, slide I think is the it? The last slide. Has okay. All right. So that right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this right here, right? This this uh, one on the right is the only piece of art that was provided by uh, Tessa to our animator in order to create this. Yeah. So Spine completely animates your your sprites. Uh, it also created this. Uh, we've got examples of guys falling down, hitting, pushing each other, flying across the screen, all sorts of other stuff, all done from that one drawing in, inside of whatever art program you want. It's exactly like a 3D model. So what you do is, yeah, so it's amazing. It's got, it's got mesh deformation inside of it. And so when you, when they, when you set up the bones, you, you rig it just like a 3D model, right? You've got bones uh, and everything inside of there, different types of bones. And then the animator comes in and moves them around and, and the movement in one part of the body might affect the movement in another part of the body. And then he can just animate uh, the, the cape in its own way as well. And part of what it does is, say for example, if I'm bending my, my arm up and my bicep would you know, get really big like it does when I do that mentally. <laughs> really uh, big. <laughs> right. So, uh, so if that were to happen, then the then the program would cause the sprite to stretch and, um, and give the impression of that bicep <laughs> growing. And like I said, these are all done in in spine as well. With one piece of artwork. Yeah, one piece of artwork. Katini rolls up into a ball. Yeah. From one piece of artwork, it absolutely blows my mind every time I see it. And it's, I mean, still animation is. We've done. We've probably done close to 100 animations in this game as far as telling the story and putting all sorts of things like this together. And if you can imagine doing all that with sprite sheets, it would have taken forever. Uh, yeah, but we've cranked it all out in about two and a half months, somewhere around there, mm -hmm. which has been really fantastic. Yeah. I don't know what question I was answering anymore, but hopefully that <laughs> answered it. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Mm -hmm. What's your marketing plan? I What's you kind of touched on it, but like, we're going to do this Good question. Here, this, there. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So I can't give you full details yet. Question is, uh, what's the marketing plan? Yeah, question is, what's yeah. the marketing plan? What I can tell, I've got a, a whole other slide or deck for that, and I don't <laughs> have that deck up right at the moment. Um, so the first thing is to identify the target audience, right? So in mobile, uh, just about on mobile in general, your primary users are going to be women between the ages of 35 and 45. On games, mobile, especially puzzle games or mind puzzle games like ours, so, uh, your audience is also going to be women 25 to 35, 25 to 45. So there's a lot of synchronization there uh, and definitely is a large part of our primary audience. Uh, if you have the ability to get information from App Annie, that's great, but I don't know any indie developers with $5,000 uh, a month to spare for, <laughs> for the kind of data they get. There's, uh, I think it's AppSea that provides the data, I can't remember right at the moment. But you can get up to five different competitors' games that are in a very similar uh, genre of yours. So for us, there's Sudoku, there's Logic Grid Puzzles, there's Monument Valley, there's The Room. There's, there's a variety of different puzzles that have either the heavy logic thinking like ours does, 15 minute pl uh, session times, uh, somewhere around there to the heavy story component that ours has. So we go out and we research those different um, groups and find out alternate demographics. But pretty much all of that comes down to the women 25 
to 45 being the primary demographic. Uh, another demographic for this game is, is obviously the, uh, the pangolin and people who are interested in pangolins, uh, conservationists who are working with pangolins. And we love talking to them online, on Twitter, on Facebook, and developing relationships there. And that's just been a, a fun thing for us to do uh, as far as this game goes. Um, so identified. once we have once we have our, our target audience identified, and there's more of that to go, uh, we've been developing relationships with uh, two different types of groups, basically. There's people to help us make art for video, and there's people to place that video. Because <laughs> uh, if you want to have your game so sold right now, pretty much the only thing it's going to be through is through video, right? Everybody watches video, they scroll past anything else. Um, so those groups are going to be spending probably 70 to 80 percent of our budget on Facebook and Google, and then another 20 to 30 percent of that budget on groups like Chart Boost or Ads Flyer or any of those other groups that are putting ads in other people's games. So the first thing we want to do, obviously, is target other games that are similar to ours that are using ads, paid ads, whatever it may be, and have our, our ads be served inside those games. And so that's another way that we're targeting that audience there uh, through that. Okay, so 78% of that, uh, and then the, the ads are going out there. The main thing that I've learned recently, and this is, uh, is that when you're making ads on Facebook, it takes about $100,000 in order to get over a course of a month to get Facebook primed and using your ads and delivering people to people you want to deliver to. And in order okay. to do that, the way it's done is they'll dump anywhere between 10 and 20 different videos, not the same video, different videos with different A-B testing or whatever it is uh, that you're doing in there, dumping those onto Facebook all at once. Facebook then has changed their algorithms. It used to be all based on LTV, so basically, you dump all these videos into your into your Facebook algorithm. You'd measure the responses. You'd do the data collection. You'd crunch the numbers, find out which ones are delivering to your target audience, reinform your uh, the way that you're doing your targeting, and then try to narrow that down. Uh, Facebook's moved to what's called return on ad spend, uh, and they measure return on ad spend by the events that they track inside your funnel. So when you're putting your 10, 20 videos in there, Facebook's measuring which ones are people clicking on, which ones are leading to installs, which ones are leading to com conversions or conversations or likes, and then they make decisions about which ones of those 10 to 20 ads they're going to start pushing to the people that are responding to them, not you. Uh, so one way that we can then figure out which of those ads are going to be more successful is once we fit, once Facebook makes those decisions, we can look at what they're deciding on. We can see which ads are running, try to figure out trends, and try to match it to data that we're collecting in analytics from whatever analytics package we're using, whether it be Firebase or Unity Analytics, and try to make our ads uh, reach the ones that are actually playing our game longer and, and sitting there inside of it. Uh, so all of that type stuff is very complicated and I'm doing a really bad job of summarizing it. Uh, but in general, we have uh, an agency that we're looking into working with to help us do that ad buy, um, which is once again a very complicated thing as well. Um, but that's the, that's the marketing plan, yeah. if that answers the question well. Yeah, cool. Uh, last question. Mm -hmm. um, does the game itself like, deal with the flight of the family? Yes. Yes. The, the question is, does the game itself deal with the plight of the pangolin? It is all about that. Um, a sneak peek of the story, little Katiti you see there at the beginning of not the... Not too much. Not too much. I'll try not to give too much away. But she's uh, she's with her mom and they're, you know, enjoying the pangolin life. And then they both get stolen by poachers. And that starts the actual story of the game. So the bad guys that you saw, actually I'll show you right here. So these are our bad guys in the game. We've got uh, the Chinese guy here who wants to eat all the pangolins, <laughs> rest, steal all the pangolins and, you know, fund his black market organization. And he's got these two two little minions with him here. Um, and uh, they represent kind of the nations where this is a problem. China being the largest uh, Import. eater of, pa yeah, importer and eater, illegal uh, importer of pangolins. Uh, followed closely by the Middle East and also Africa, unfortunately. Um, they've eaten all the pangolins in Asia, so now they're going to Africa to find the last remaining pangolins and shipping them to Asia. 
So the game does touch on those subjects uh, kind of in a playful way because we want it to be appropriate for children and not be too scary or gory. Um, we're also trying to work in, we haven't figured out how we're going to do it just yet, but we're trying to work in facts about pangolins that you kind of unlock uh, through exploring the beautiful artwork um, that then these guys would kind of step out of their character roles and sort of describe, yeah, this is what's happening in the real world with pangolins, you know, this is, this is why they're becoming endangered. This is specifically how you can help. Uh, one of the ways we want to make the game help is by actually uh, donating some of the profits to um, conservation groups um, who deal exclusively with rescuing the pangolin from its plight. So basically the, the idea there is while you're playing, you're actually um, you're being given these messages and stuff like that that say you are actually helping the pangolin in the real world by playing this game, by getting to the next level, things like that. Um, it's all tied into the achievements that are based in yeah. the game. There's certain based achievements and as you progress through the game, you unlock facts, and assuming we have any profit from the game, then uh, yeah, that is one of our goals to, to implement. Right. So yeah, there's there's quite a bit that the game touches on about real pangolins and what they're actually going through. Yeah. So we tried to we tried to summarize two years worth of work <laughs> and, and, and progress lessons. and change. We had so many failures uh, going into this game. I mean, uh, we've done a lot of things right, a ton of things right, but I figured that people could learn from our failures, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, just as much as they could learn from our, our successes. So mm -hmm. we tried to highlight those things that we thought were um, learning points. points and improving points for us, things that we're definitely improving from and learning from and modifying the way we go forward. Um, and so I hope all of this was useful for you guys. If you guys want to talk further or just hang out and chat games, uh, we'd love it. Mm -hmm. uh, we love talking games and love talking about these things. So uh, just reach out shoot us a line or whatever, we'd be happy to, to chat. Yeah. Thank you.